So this is the first ever time you have the, you see the global South have, have both the willingness and ability to stay out of the Western Civil War 2.0, which is the Ukraine war. No matter how much the Russians say, you know, this is, we're not the West, by the way, anymore. But it is part of the Western Civil War. And the non West would say, well, you know, sorry, it's not our business. And at the same time, they try to push for more uh, peaceful possible solution. Thank you very much for uh, this great uh, conference. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here in this very delightful and beautiful city of Kyoto, my first ever visit. I've learned so much from all of you, uh, the speakers and the panels in the past two days. But today I'm presenting um, the Chinese position of the so-called so uh, principled uh, neutrality, which has been controversial in the uh, Anglo sphere, by the way. Um, so, um, but let me start with a very quick definition of what principled neutrality really means for the Chinese. It's different from the typical permanent neutrality that we've been talking about. Someone would just shut himself off from the diver uh, diversity or complexity of the real world. No matter what's going on, I'll be myself. Uh, and, and but Chinese version of uh, neutrality is China does have its own thinking about what's right and wrong, and also uh, try to work to promote the end of violence. Uh, for example, China strongly believe that the UN principle of territorial integrity and sovereignty should be preserved no matter what, and that is for the interest of Ukraine. China has never ever retreated from that point. China has not recognized the seizure of Crimea and even the three, uh, you know, uh, uh, those border states of, um, of Ukraine. At the same time, Chinese also argue the root cause of the Ukraine conflict can be traced all the way to the relentless NATO eastward expansion. So that's something too need to be addressed for the enduring peace, not just for the Russians, the Europeans, the Chinese, but for the whole world in the age of weapons mass destruction and in artificial intelligence. To talk about who is going to win the war or Russia must be defeated, this is like something to talk about who is winning the earthquake uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Mexico City or hurricane in uh, South Carolina, no winners. And particularly the alternative is not something, it, it's unthinkable. So this is the Chinese version of uh, neutrality or principle of neutrality. We do have uh, the belief or our own observation what's, who is right, with or what is the source of the problem. So this is a, something I want to get. So for that, I want to uh, talk briefly uh, what I see the three um, main drivers or points I put here in, in a single sheet. And uh, the current Chinese-Russian relationship is a major factor for the Chinese neutral stance. And the second major point is I want to put this Chinese uh, neutrality in the context of the rise of the non-West or global South. And, and the third is I want to provide a cultural perspective, which is something perhaps less known from the outside. So let me start with my uh, three strikes and I'll be out. Um, number one, I think there are two opposing sectors of literature now in the study of Chinese neutrality. One is the so-called, uh, I see the proliferation of a strategic partnership or comprehensive partnership between Ru the Chinese and Russian leaders talk about as, you know, so many. I myself confused. At the same time, Chinese uh, developed the same thing to many other countries. I, I forgot how many st strategic partners China's have, by the way. I lost count of it. And, and this is one end, it's, a, it's an inflated notion about bilateral relationship. On the other side, you have the 
uh, a growing and more fashionable use of axis of evil, axis of authoritarianism, like uh, my good friend of uh, uh, Professor Sutter in Georgetown University, and also uh, Bobo Lowe's book in uh, 2008, The Axis of Convenience about China-Russian relations. So it's a proliferation of, of access. To demonize anything China-Russia do is, is a threat to the West, so the threat school. So I think my approach is, despite all those inflated, uh, uh, highly value-oriented notions of China-Russian relationship, basically Moscow-Beijing has been in a normal state. A normal state because this is the only first time ever since 1989 that the China-Russian relationship has been stable and equal and mutually beneficial. In the previous 200 plus years, ever since the beginning of 19th century, all the way till the end of World Cold War, there had been a massive intrusion of the Russian slash Soviet intrusion into China. First in, this, in the format of colonialism, Russia joined the British, the French, the Japanese to carve up China and competing for their own influence. So this is all the way last to the 20th century, and then we replaced by the Bolshevik and the Soviet, uh, you know, uh, idealism and the Stalin's brutal realism. And, and this was followed by what I see the honeymoon uh, China-Soviet alliance, which was quickly switched to a nightmare or hostility for the next 30 years, all the way till 1989 when the two countries normalize their relations. So this is a, a normal state, when the two sides start to see each other as who they are, not necessarily what they imagine. And, and, and this is the state of maybe like a, a marriage between, uh, you know, gender relationship is pretty much like an international relation. Chinese-Russian uh, relation has been going through honeymoon and they quickly switched to divorce. We never experienced any marriage, marriage by the way. So now the normal state is like marriage, which is a far more challenging, difficult, nuanced, when the two sides start to interact with one another. Those of you who are married, you know marriage is not something uh, you can take for granted. You need to compromise. So this is something that two sides start to engage on the relatively equal position. It's a normal relation by any standard. So this is something I would say it's, it's uh, very, very different from the previous 200 years when there's an overwhelming one side uh, intrusion and, and, and sweeping uh, intrusion into Chinese domestic politics. Um, and the, another point I want to address is uh, the, the Russians' two borders. And, and, you know, in this case, I would say Russian China border currently more than 4,000 kilometers long, it used to be 7,000 but the Soviet collapse and leaving Central Asian state. And um, the two sides actually worked for 15 years from the beginning of the normalization in 1989 all the way to 2004 and to sign that final treaty to legalize the 4,000 kilometer line. And the SCO or uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a vehicle for the two sides to interact with one another, working together with the Central Asian state to create kind of like a, a, a you know, a, 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 like a buffer zone or, or a, a stable borderline and inspect it on the annual basis. So it started with this a very painful, slow moving, and then finally in 2004. So that was kind of a very important if you look at the Western front, I mean, Ukraine or Russia's Western border is a totally different story. And now I'm wondering, what if the West did what the Chinese did to work with the Russians to stabilize the border? You may have a different you know, outcome. So this is the, the, the totally different two tales of the Russians two borders. I'm not saying that the Chinese approach is better than the West, but it's a different approach. And we should examine it. See how nations settle down the long-term conflict for hundreds of years 
China actually suffered so much, but did not take advantage of the weakening of the Russians. Maybe because the Chinese really believe what the Bismarck used to say, that Russia is not as strong or weak as it appears. Russia has tremendous potential, but also tremendous ability to mess around. But respect that the great power, don't play with it. Because the previous history with Russia has been devastating for the Chinese, even for my generation. We used to blame the Russians for everything, for the Soviet imperialism. That's bullshit. After Cultural Revolution, the Chinese really examine our own problems. We don't blame others for our problem. Let's do as a, let us learn from everybody. That's Chinese opening and reform all about. So Russia is a very important element in China's um, perception of outside world. So I think that's, um, I really want to emphasize that uh, I brought in uh, George Cannon's uh, 1970, uh, 1997, uh, New York Times piece, and he regarded NATO expansion as a, a fatal error. This was two years before the first wave of NATO expansion in 1999. But President Clinton conveniently ignored him. Maybe he was confused by Lewinsky. I don't know. Um, but the rest were history. But the history never ends. So let's move, let me move to the second point. If you look at the long term history, it's a, I want to pick up from Samuel Huntington's uh, uh, provocative treatise, The Civilizational Clash in 1994. In this article, he raised a concept that the entire history between Westphalia to the end of the Cold War was one of Western, quote, civil war. Westerners killing Westerners. This is, a, uh, I think, it's a sweeping uh, uh, in, uh, historical stroke. But Huntington somehow missed something important. This Western civil war never meant to be Western. It touches, not touch it. It meant colonization, control, slave trade, which is the first globalization. And then in both world wars, the non-West part would forced into fighting and fought on both sides. And the West really dictated the terms and the non-West or South had no choice. And in World War II, Chinese were slaughtered 35 million, by the way, 27 Russians, but Chinese suffered most. So this is the first ever time you have the, you see the global South have, have both the willingness and ability to stay out of the Western Civil War 2.0, which is the Ukraine War. No matter how much the Russians say, you know, this is, we're not the West, by the way, anymore. But it is part of the Western Civil War. And the non West would say, well, you know, sorry, it's not our business. And at the same time, they try to push for more uh, peaceful possible solution. Just last month at the UN uh, annual conference, there is a creation of the Friends for Peace by um, uh, 13 uh, non-Western countries and also including Egypt, Brazil, China, uh, Turkey, and try to find uh, a third way. By the way, there are many, many uh, proposals uh, going on, but I think this is one by the collective South. And I hope that this is uh, uh, maybe one of the uh, efforts that would, would push for that. So that's the, um, I think that the, the, the note, and China is, is, is part of this. The, um, I think the, another point uh, is uh, to see how this Chinese neutrality would work. And that is the, I would argue, it's a long way from 1954, when the non-aligned movement was launched, China, Yugoslavia, uh, Egypt, Indonesia joined the non-aligned movement, and in 1954, uh, and then uh, you know lots of things going on all the way to 1982, when China declared officially independent foreign policy, independent from both the North, uh, the, the, the West and the Soviet camp. That was 1982. 40 years later, 
we see the continuity of the neutrality in the Ukraine war. So this is uh, the, uh, it's not just the Ukraine war, but China has been continuously staying away from the East and the West. So this is the, and, and, and within the context of the global. Then finally, I want to um, move to the cultural um, element. I think um, I want to uh, introduce this very, um, in, in, in 1997, the US House of Representatives published a resolution um, to commemorate the 2000 uh, seven some years, 100 years of Confucius' birthday. And one of the major ideas of the House of Representatives, by the way, it, it was a past. It's amazing from today's point because China has become a, a, a number one enemy. In, in, in Lots of people love, still love Russians, by the way. Lots of Ohio's would love Putin rather than the, the Democrats. Um, but China has become public enemy number one. But this isn't just, you know, 1997, don't do the things to the others if others if you don't want the others to do the same thing. And there are many other elements of Confucianism that is kind of advocated in this resolution. For example, like, like a great thinker, teacher, social philosopher, blah, 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 blah. But this is the one to me is something like a Treaty of Westphalia, right? Except it was a 1500 years before Treaty of Philly. Yeah. Don't mess around other uh, countries. So this is something that I would say. But I would be critical of this relationship because it missed the important core idea of Confucianism, which is the middle way. This is a square, right? And I don't stretch the imagination like a tennis court, volleyball court, court. The notion of the middle way is essentially draw a central line, like a typical uh, 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 sport court. And this is what the Chinese language means, the middle way, just middle. Chinese language is graphic, unlike Romanized or Latinized, just, just a picture. And this also means neutrality. And this also means China. So out of this sense of neutrality are two different types of international system. One is the Treaty of Westphalia and all the way, you know, you see uh, the ideas is equality, sovereignty, and the Chinese based regional system is hierarchy, according to David Kang of University of Southern California. And totally the opposite. But if you look at the operating mechanism, Westphalia Treaty does not prevent war except religious wars. But the other wars continue to fight. And out of the Treaty of the Westphalia, through those decades, 500 independent entities in Europe were reduced to 20. There's a large number of losers despite its declared principle of sovereignty and equality, okay? And uh, so many wars, Western or non-West. But if you look at the hierarchical system in East Asia, by the way, this is not democratic. It's, it's not appealing to the hearts of many people in Asia now. I, I agree with them. It's the old system is gone. But this system has based on a cultural influence and the notion of impartiality, which means this is a Henry Kissinger's definition. Chinese notion of internet means impartiality, not the equality, not the balance of power, but the cultural effect. The outcome of the Chinese regional system is remarkably stable, lack of interstate wars. So let me finish by showing the last and this is David Kang's county. You don't have to read the finance. So many words on the on the uh, on this side. This is the West Bay system, and there's a little or nothing interstate wars, except the two. The two um, 
through that the Chinese troops entered Korea and Vietnam and all eventually withdraw. The Chinese were remarkably aloof from interfering other countries' domestic affairs. But once all things were happening, Asia became a war zone. So this is a um, Confucianist. Thank you.